My name is Claude Butner, and it's my honor to be the host of today's presentation, Bright Green Lies. Our speaker today is Lier Keith, a radical feminist of 40 years, author of seven books, including The Vegetarian Myth, Food, Justice, and Sustain Sustainability, which has been called the most important ecological book of this generation. She is co-author with Derek Jensen and Max Wilbert of Bright Green Lies, How the Environmental Movement Lost Its Way and What We Can Do About It. She's also been arrested six times for acts of political resistance. Environmentalism was about saving wild places and wild creatures. Now it's about finding a new power source to continue their destruction. There are three bright green lies. Industrial civilization can be sustained if we simply switch fuels. Alternative energy can power industrial consumption and green energy is benign. However, so-called green technology from source to disposal is a trail of devastation across open pit mining, clear cut forests, acid rivers, dying oceans, poisoned children, and everywhere species pushed towards extinction. These technologies aren't green, they are blood red, rooted in extraction, dependent on diesel and swollen with pollution. Any solution that doesn't aim to stop the destruction is no solution. This is a call to remember its original, original source before it's too late, love of our planet, our one and only home. And now, Lier, the floor is yours. Well, thanks for having me. So in the beginning, two million years ago, don't worry, I'm gonna go fast, uh, the genus Homo arrives on the plains of Africa, and that's us. Homo sapiens appears 400,000 years ago, and by 200,000 years ago, they are identical to modern humans. By 100,000 years ago, we're burying our dead and we're doing it ritualistically. By 50,000 years ago, we have modern human culture. People are making clothes from hides, they're making jewelry, musical instruments, and there's more sophisticated hunting techniques. There's barter and there's art. What are we painting? Well, we're painting a lot of animals. Um, and this is the second most common art project. The oldest known musical instrument was found near her and it was a flute carved from a vulture bone. And there are the remains of the usual reindeer, cave bear, ibex, mammoths, all the animals that people were eating. The first art we ever made was of the megafauna and the mega females because that was who gave us life. The first thing we did with our human consciousness was say, thank you. I think this is the beginning of religion and that the sacredness of awe and thanksgiving is built into us, body and brain. And for all that time, for two million years, we were not monsters and destroyers. We were participants. If the length of that field is our time on earth, it's only the last half a yard that represents the time we've been doing agriculture the last one fifth of an inch would be the industrial revolution. So at half a yard is where the disaster begins. In maybe 14 different places around the world, people completely change their way of life with an activity called agriculture. In very brute terms, you take a piece of land, you clear every living thing off it, and I mean down to the bacteria, and then you plant it to human use. So it's biotic cleansing. This is Iraq, one of the places where agriculture started. No one in their right mind would call this place the Fertile Crescent now. This is Iran, 94% of Iran's agricultural land is degraded. That's not a mountain in the background, that's a cloud of dust. That was soil and now it's dust. One third of Pakistan is under risk for desertification. 150 years ago, this was a deciduous forest, a teak forest. So you pull down the forest, you rip up the prairie, you drain the wetland, you exsanguinate the world of water and soil and species, the process of life itself, until all that is left is dust. So to state the obvious, no culture that is destroying the basis of life can be called sustainable. Really, it can only be called insane. 
Now in all the places where agriculture started, human society follows the same pattern. It's called civilization. Now that word just means people living in cities. What that actually means is that they need more than their land can give. Food, water, energy have to come from somewhere else. From that point forward, it doesn't matter what lovely, peaceful, nonviolent values people hold in their hearts, that society is dependent on imperialism and genocide because no one willingly gives up their land, their water, their trees. But since the city has used up its own, it has to go out and get those from somewhere else. And that's the last 10,000 years in a few sentences. This is simple arithmetic. If you have one planet, one blanket of air, one cradle of soil, one place called home, and you destroy it, it's one minus one. This is the pattern of civilization over and over and over. There's a bloated power center surrounded by conquered colonies from which the center extracts what it wants until eventually it collapses. That collapse takes between 800 and maybe 2000 years until the soil gives out. Make no mistake, the planet has been skinned alive and what should be habitat for millions of creatures turns into salt and dust. Agricultural societies end up militarized and they always do for three reasons. One, agriculture creates a surplus and it, if it can be stored, it can be stolen. So the surplus needs to be protected. Two, imperialism. Agriculture is a war against the natural world. Eventually the agriculturalists need more land, more soil, more resources. So there's an entire class of people whose job is war, whose job is taking land and resources by force. Agriculture makes that possible. It also makes it inevitable. And three is slavery. By the year 1800, when the fossil fuel age began, fully three quarters of the people on this planet were living in conditions of slavery, indenture, or serfdom. And once you have huge numbers of the population in slavery, you need someone to keep them there. So this is Lewis Mumford. The symbiosis of technology and culture is what Lewis Mumford called a technic. A social milieu creates specific technologies which in turn shape the culture. So he writes, a new configuration of technical invention, scientific observation and centralized political control gave rise to the peculiar mode of life we may now identify without eulogy as civilization. Its Herculean feats of mechanical organization rested on ruthless physical coercion, forced labor and slavery. This centralized techniques created complex human machines composed of specialized, standardized, replaceable, interdependent parts, the work army, the military army, the bureaucracy. These work armies and military armies raised the ceiling of human achievement, the first in mass construction, the second in mass destruction, both on a scale hitherto inconceivable. Technology is anything but neutral or passive in its effects. Plowshares will require swords and then armies of slaves and soldiers. The technique that is civilization has required weapons of conquest from the beginning, farming spread by genocide. The destruction of Cro-Magnon Europe, the culture that bequeathed us let's go, took maybe 300 years by the farmer soldiers from the, from the Near East. The only thing exchanged between these two cultures was violence. Quote, all these artifacts are weapons and there is no reason to believe they were exchanged in a nonviolent manner. Technologies contain the transmutational force of a technic, creating a seamless suite of social institutions and corresponding ideologies. Technics are never neutral. Their ideologies will either be authoritarian or democratic, hierarchical or egalitarian or as Chellis Glendening writes with spare eloquence, all technologies are political. So the very creation myth of Western civilization tells men to dominate, to conquer, to go forth and multiply. 
No hunter gatherer is told by God to willfully overshoot their land's carrying capacity and no marginally rational person would listen to such a God. Alongside agriculture, metallurgy and mining developed as another authoritarian technique. The first metal tools were mostly weapons and they were copper, but copper was quickly replaced by bronze, which is an alloy of copper and tin. Iron came next and finally steel. It's not possible to overstate the del deleterious impact that metallurgy has had on human societies and biotic communities. It hardly matters which material we examine, the horrors are the same. The forest stripped to bare rock, the rock hacked, bludgeoned, or bombed into cavernous pits, the pits engulfing sweeps of land that will not recover until the next ice age recedes. Surrounding the devastation is always more, the leech ponds, the toxic tailings, the acid rain, the ulcerated fish, the fine particulates shredding lung tissue with every breath. This photo is of a toxic lake 60 miles wide, the result of mining for rare earth metals for solar panels. In the eight centuries of Rome's reign, it covered Greenland, which is 4,000 miles away in 800 tons of copper and 400 tons of lead from its mines. Victims of Rome's industri industrial pollution may have numbered in the millions across Europe and the Middle East. The health impacts then as now are ghastly, convulsions, vomiting, diarrhea, anemia, stunted fetal growth, mental retardation, and cancer. This is why mines are always fiercely opposed by the people con condemned to endure them. And so the work army requires the military army. Slaves have to be conquered and then controlled. The silver mines of ancient Greece funded its vast imperial navy, devastation, destruction, and slavery spawning more of the same. This is the totalizing scale of authoritarian techniques, which both creates and then requires hierarchical social relations, turning humans into machines that convert more life into more machines. And as all of this develops, the slavery, the militarism, the hierarchy, the culture becomes patriarchal. The moment men create private property, they want to control paternity, which means they need to control women. Masculinity is essential to any militarized culture because that's the psychology necessary in soldiers. One can only kill on command if the human impulse to care for one another has been subdued or eradicated and if the psychological process of othering is well entrenched. Central to masculinity is a violation imperative. Men become, quote, real men by breaking boundaries. For the entitled psyche, the only reason that no exists is because it's a sexual thrill to force past it. The real brilliance of patriarchy is right here. It doesn't just naturalize oppression, it sexualizes acts of oppression. It eroticizes domination and submission, and then institutionalizes those into masculinity and femininity. So it naturalizes, it eroticizes, and then institutionalizes domination and submission. The brilliance of feminism is that we figured that out. So all of it merges in that masculine violation imperative. That imperative includes breaking the sexual boundaries of women and children, the cultural and political boundaries of indigenous people, the biological boundaries of rivers and forests, the genetic boundaries of other species, and the physical boundaries of the atom itself. Authoritarian techniques require a specific social arrangement, patriarchal, hierarchical, militaristic, specialized, and mechanistic. All of that requires, as it produces, an internal theological rationale that life is a series of disconnected objects, things we might call plants or animals or rivers, not complete beings with whom we are engaged in relationship. Mechanical objects are not self-willed creatures. They don't call respect from us. They barely deserve notice. 
they exist to be used. Rene Descartes bragged, I have described this earth and indeed this whole visible world as a machine. Our science is a series of discoveries designed to let us use them better and use them we have. There is no break in the system. Why would there be? Indeed, violation is built into mechanistic science. Sir Francis Bacon is credited with the creation of the scientific method. His practical objective was bluntly, quote, domination over creation. That was what he wanted. 300 years later, Eric Fromm describes sadism as the passion to have absolute and unrestricted control over a, over a living being. Is there a more apt description of industrial civilization? Its technology has emptied rivers, crushed mountains, damaged the climate, and broken the boundaries of the atom itself. And the end point of sadism is necrophilia the passion to transform that which is alive into something unalive, to destroy for the sake of destruction, the exclusive interest in all that is purely mechanical. Or as Mary Daly wrote in 1978, patriarchy is itself the prevailing religion of the entire planet and its essential message is necrophilia. Having declared the cosmos lifeless, industrial humans are now transforming the biosphere into the technosphere, a dead world of our own artifacts that life as a whole may not survive. So our book, Bright Green Lies, has three main themes. The first is that industrial civilization requires industrial levels of energy. That's what it takes to fuel the wholesale conversion of living communities into dead commodities. That conversion is the problem. The task before us is not how to continue to fuel that conversion, it's how to stop it. The second point is that fossil fuel, especially oil, is functionally irreplaceable. The proposed alternatives like solar, wind, hydro, and biomass will never scale up to power an industrial economy. You can't argue with physics, Bill McKibben likes to say. No, you can't, and he of all people should know better. Third, the proposed technologies are in their own right assaults against the living world. From beginning to end, they require industrial scale devastation, open pit mining, deforestation, soil toxification that's permanent on anything but a geologic time scale, extirpation and extinction of vulnerable species, and Oh yes, fossil fuel. So-called green technologies are some of the most destructive industrial processes ever invented. And the scale of them is grotesque. They will not save the earth. They will only hasten its demise. A solar panel is not the fruit of the solar tree. Um, you don't go out at harvest time and collect them in a bucket. They are manufactured through an intensive industrial process requiring specialized equipment, fossil fuels, and a wide range of toxic substances. It starts with the mining of silicon dioxide or quartz, often in the form of sand. It's stripped mine using enormous earth moving equipment that is without exception powered by diesel engines. There's no other way you're gonna do this. In the United States alone, annual extraction is about a billion tons. Globally, extraction is about 40 billion tons. Fish kills, destruction of sensitive habitats, and the disappearance of entire beaches are the result of sand mining. Two dozen Indonesian islands have been entirely destroyed in the service of silicon. These islands no longer exist. They've been consumed to death. In China, silicon production has poisoned nearby fields and sickened local residents to supply silicon to the largest PB company in the world. One researcher said, the land where you dump or bury it will be infertile. No grass or trees will grow in its place. Human beings can never touch it. It's the same the world over. In Iceland, people who live near a silicon smelter got chemical burns in their throats. Arsenic was at 20 times the legal limit. The people say they're being held hostage by the smelter as they can't breathe outside. Of course, other animals have nowhere to go but outside 
it's where they live. In Minnesota, 138 threatened and endangered species are within one mile of a silica sand site. They include turtles, fish, and plants, as well as 3,000 acres of native prairie. Since 98% of the prairie is gone, the prairie itself is, quote, extremely rare. It takes 3,000 degrees Fahrenheit to turn silicon into silicon metal for solar panels and electronics. In Washington state, that 3,000 degrees is supposed to come from the Box Canyon Dam. Only the dam produces 90 megawatts and the smelter wants 105. So this enormous dam doesn't even produce enough electricity for this heat. Silicon metal also requires wood chips, those small dead frag fragments once known as forests. It also requires blue-green, which is a rare form of coal from Kentucky, 48,000 metric tons of it every year. That's mountains reduced to rubble. A smelter in Idaho would produce not just silicon metal for our shiny green future, but also 320,000 tons of greenhouse gases, making it the fifth largest producer in the state. It would also produce acid rain from its annual 760 tons of sulfur dioxide and 700 tons of nitrogen oxides. Polysilicon production produces about four tons of liquid waste for every ton of polysilicon produced. In Germany, Siemens produces solar panels and the technology is installed to process the silicon tetrachloride waste and render it more or less harmless, but it's expensive. So the cost to produce polysilicon was about $84,500 a ton in Germany. Chinese companies have been uh, producing it for as little as $21,000 a ton by just dumping the toxic waste in rural areas on powerless village communities. Of course, the local people and environmentalists protested. They have been tortured by their government, literally tortured. So the next time you hear how the price of solar panels is declining, remember this. The missing islands, 138 endangered species, chemical burns in the throat, the tortured activists. Remember all of this. Solar panel production is one of the leading sources of hexafluoroethane, nitrogen trifluoride, and sulfur hexafluoride, three extremely potent greenhouse gases. Hexafluoroethane is 12,000 times more potent than carbon dioxide, and it's 100% manufactured by humans. It doesn't exist in nature. It survives 10,000 years once released into the atmosphere. Nitrogen trifluoride is 17,000 times more virulent than CO2, and sulfur hexafluoride is 25,000 times more powerful than carbon dioxide. Concentrations of nitrogen trifluoride in the atmosphere are rising 11% per year. This is where solar panels come from. This is the damage they do. So engineer Mark J Jacobson, he created these detailed plans for a global transition to 100% quote renewable energy by 2030. Wind provides for half. This would mean building 3.8 million five megawatt wind turbines. This would require more than 2.4 billion tons of steel, 1.9 million tons of copper, 133 million tons of composite fiber materials, and around 2.6 billion tons of concrete and steel for the foundations. That amount of steel is 120% of the steel produced across the entire world in 2018. Steel is made from iron ore. Charcoal is needed to smelt the ore. One single mine requires 2,400 square miles of forest to be turned into charcoal for one mine. Or iron ore mines threaten endangered species. They displace tens of thousands of indigenous people. They produce incessant air pollution. They create forced labor, child slavery, and sex trafficking. And they require networks of roads which lead to further poaching and illegal logging. Iron ore mining has left entire towns with lung disease. Toxic 
tailings, the sludge from these mining operations is impounded behind huge earthen dams, which of course fail. A 2015 collapse in Brazil destroyed two villages, killed 19 people, polluted water supplies for 400,000 people, and re released more than 43 million cubic metric uh, me cubic meters of toxic waste into 400 miles of rivers and streams and eventually the Atlantic Ocean. The report uses the term eliminating all aquatic life to describe what has happened to the river. Turbines kill birds and bats and in horrible ways. If Jacobson's plan was instituted, the death toll for birds may be close to 100 million. Jacobson's plan would result in 250 million dead bats annually. Some species may plummet by 90% due to the turbines that already exist. We are looking at a world without bats. Right now in Scotland, a huge swath of Klaus in Derek Forest is under threat. A quarter of the forest will be felled for wind turbines and their attendant infrastructure right through the last refugium of the Scottish wildcat. They number 35. There are no missing numbers, no missing zeros in that number. 35 are all that remain. That's more a whisper than a number. The stripped dry skeleton of a species. They are the only wild felines left on the island of Great Britain and they will be lost to the willful extinction in the service of the wind power. Are we the people who love the forest? Or are we happy to trade them in? Trees, birds, cats, and all for giant machines that will flash like 30 pieces of silver in the sun. Dams kill rivers. The only good thing I can say about dams is that eventually they fail. Dams are major sources of greenhouse gas emissions. Their reservoirs are responsible for as much as 4% of global greenhouse gas emissions. It's the vegetation that's under the reservoir. It's degraded by anaerobic bacteria and the process releases methane. Reservoirs are quote, the largest single anthropogenic source of methane being responsible for 23% of all methane emissions due to human activities, end quote. One researcher calls dams methane factories. Hydroelectricity has been codified as, quote, carbon free in the Kyoto Protocol and the United Nations Agreements on Climate Change. Under this lie, major funding agencies are investing hundreds of billions of dollars in dam building, and it's all a lie. These are not carbon neutral. In Brazil alone, 60 new dams would flood an area of rainforest the size of Michigan. Construction would cause, in the words of one riverine scientist, quote, massive environmental damage all the way from the eastern slopes of the Indies to the Atlantic Ocean. Large dam projects not only destroy rivers, they also destroy indigenous rights. Resistors have faced beatings, sexual assault, and other forms of torture. At least 124 Honduran activists fighting dams, logging mines, and tourist resorts have been murdered since 2010. And it's not just the global south. The Site C Dam in British Columbia is expected to flood 15,000 acres of the Peace River Valley, including thousands of cultural sites and hunting, fishing, and gathering places. It will also fragment one of the most important wildlife passages in the Yellowstone to Yukon Migration Corridor, Okanagan Grand Chief Stuart Phillip and Ben Prophet write that the whole region looks like, quote, one giant industrial sacrifice zone. Up to 80 million people have been displaced by dams, mostly indigenous and the rural poor. And then there's biomass. Um, forests across the world are being felled to feed Europe's demand for biofuels. Why? Because what bright greens call biomass and what you and I might call deforestation has been declared carbon neutral by fiat. There are dozens of huge pulp mills just in the southeastern United States exporting 100% of this quote biomass to Europe. Somewhere between 50 and 80% of the southern wetland forest is already gone and the area is being logged four times faster than the South American rainforest. 
This forest has been an ancient refugium since the Pleistocene. The biological diversity is, quote, virtually unparalleled in North America. The forest is lush with reptiles, amphibians, butterflies, and mammals who exist nowhere else and are barely hanging on. This includes the endangered southeastern American kestrel, the smallest falcon in North America. They depend on the red, red cockaded woodpeckers who are built for hollowing out nest cavities, but raptors are not. So the kestrels need abandoned woodpecker nests. This is the mutual dependent that aggregates everywhere, always into life as a whole. In case it needs saying, the red cockaded woodpecker is also endangered. Last in this elegiac sample is the gopher tortoise. 400 other species depend on the burrows that the tortoise digs. 400 other mammals, birds, reptiles, amphibians, and insects cannot survive without the protective cover created by the tortoises, tortoises who are now critically endangered. To scale up a phrase, an insult to one is a permanent injury to all. With insults as catastrophic as an entire biotic community pelleted, shipped to Europe and burned. And the real kicker, biomass creates 20% more greenhouse gases then coal. Add the energy needed to fell, chip, dry, and ship the pellets to Europe, and it's another 20% more greenhouse gases than coal. 40% total, more than coal. You might as well just burn the coal. Like with the dams, the people in charge decided by fiat that biomass would count as climate neutral, even though it's 40% worse than coal. Once we fought for the living, now we are told to fight for their deaths as the turbines come from the mountains and solar conquers the deserts. So the three main points, industrial civilization requires industrial levels of energy. That's what it takes to fuel the wholesale conversion of living communities into dead commodities. That conversion is the problem. Fossil fuel, especially oil, is functionally irreplaceable. The proposed alternatives will never scale up to power an industrial economy. And finally, the proposed technologies are assaults against the living world. We are wasting time we don't have on solutions that won't work. What we need is resistance. Every last one of us descends from a line of people who fought as civilization is universally resisted. But our choice now is very stark. Stand with the living or go down with the dead. Thank you. I know that's a wee bit grim. We're used to it at KCOR. And, and we my debate people, it. My people. <laughs> and, and we debate it. We're, we are we run the full spectrum. Um it feels like, uh, and I'll just, I don't see Bill Reese on this uh, guest list here, but it seems like we're headed for that uh, high mortality event eventually, uh, no matter how long we can hang on to the civilization. Would you care to, uh, Lier, uh, action, it, it's always, we struggle with what should we be doing? And uh, some of us do see the actions that are being proposed as bright green lies again, just to placate us. Uh, and not all of us want to go out there and get arrested one time, let alone seven times. Bravo, <laughs> by the way, Lear, the courage to do that. <laughs> um, so, so I'm inviting you to, um, where do you see us going in three years, 30 years? Well, here's the thing, you know, there's, we could bring this to a halt. I mean, there's no physical reason. It's, we're not defying the laws of physics to stop human behavior. And this is entirely on us. You know, we've done this. We've made this way of life. We've arranged, you know, our, our affairs such that we are destroying our planet, but we could rearrange them. So I'm not someone who thinks this is human nature. That's why I start where I do, because 
I want everybody to understand that really two million years, we didn't do this planet any harm or not much harm. I mean, some of us were probably stupid, but we figured it out. Um, and then, you know, we lived really well um, in that original way. And we made beautiful art and had nice, you know, small tribal communities where we did rituals and ceremonies and, you know, made better arrowheads and probably enjoyed the sunset and the sunrise and, you know, loved our children and did all that, sang songs and took naps and did all that stuff. Um, we didn't do terrible things to the planet in the service of that. So I don't think it's human nature. That's my point. Um, it is a political arrangement though. And anything humans make, we can unmake. So my two points of hope are what I call the girls in the grasses. So number one, there's way too many people. And I know everyone gets frightened off talking about that. Um, and we have good reason to be frightened by it. I mean, you know, the one child policy in China has been pretty horrible, but that doesn't work. That top down stuff doesn't work. The thing that does work, and I'm sure a lot of you know this because it's been studied inside out, um, is empowering women and girls. So the number one action around the globe you can do to actually slow global population is really simple. It's teach a girl to read. Because when women and girls have even that much more power over their lives, they choose to have fewer children. It's not a hard thing. We actually just have to care about the lives of women and girls and it will happen automatically. There's already, I think, 42 countries that have either negative or steady population growth. So some of us already got there, right? Is This isn't, again, this isn't a hard ask. We just have to get it done. Um, and what we're up against is, you know, gosh, the Catholic Church, <laughs> a lot of fairly scary religions, you know, who, who know what's at stake here, because it's a lot about male power. But we have to be willing to face that and just face it down um, and give women and girls full human rights. So that's the girls part of it. And then the grasses part is um, the number one way to get the carbon out of the sky and back into the ground is we have to reverse the process of what we've done with agriculture. So, you know, somewhere around 99% of the world's um, prairies, the, the, the grasslands have been either destroyed or severely degraded. And it's really agriculture that did that. So we just need to reverse that because, you know, like forests know how to make a forest. Rivers know how to be a river. Grasslands know how to repair themselves. All we need to do is stop destroying. We can help the process too. I mean, we can repair some of it ourselves. We can, um, you know, restore the species that have been, you know, extirpated, help bring them back. I mean, I know people who do beaver restoration. There's people doing bison restoration. It's not that hard. Like life honestly wants to live. Our main job is to stop destroying. So we need to pull back from these activities that are, you know, the worst of them. And it means taking a good hard look at agriculture. Like, why did we ever start doing this? <laughs> what have we gained from it? And the answer is really nothing. We destroyed you know, we destroyed our social arrangements. It created all this hierarchy and militarization and patriarchy. It destroyed our health. And the first thing that happens to people who take up agriculture is they shrink six inches and their teeth start falling out. And we achieve perfect health as hunter gatherers. We don't as, as farmers. I mean, it's a pretty wretched way of life and it's backbreaking labor, you know, from dawn to dusk. So there's not a lot of, you know, we don't really understand why people did this. And the only explanation to me that makes any sense is that honestly it's addictive the foods are addictive um especially wheat so i that you know just throwing that out there that's one theory because the rest of it doesn't make a lot of sense um you don't see starvation you don't see famine until after agriculture begins up until that you don't see signs in in the archaeological remains that show chronic hunger that doesn't happen until after agriculture so why did anybody do it we don't know um anyway all of that, we just have to say it out loud. Like this was a bad mistake. Um, Jared Diamond, all of his work is about this. And he's got this great quote about how it was the stupidest thing humans did was take up agriculture and we have yet to recover from it. So anyway, we could just stop and we could let nature come back. We could let the forest recover. We could let the wetlands recover. We could let all the grasslands recover. And the reason I focus on the grasses is because um, grasses and ruminants make this incredible cohort and the thing that they do best is build topsoil. And that's why, for instance, um, when the European immigrants got to the Midwest in the United States, the topsoil in places was 12 feet deep. All right, now that's all been reduced to mere inches after less than 200 years um, from the plow. That's what plowing does, but that's how deep it was. Um, and that's what grasses and ruminants have evolved to do, you know, for millions of years together, they build soil. 
So, you know, there's some of the estimates I've read are if we could even repair 75, 80% of the world's destroyed grasslands by simply letting the grasses and the ruminants do their thing, um, we could sequester all of the carbon that's been released since the beginning of the industrial age in about 12 years, maybe 13, 14 years. Um, it wouldn't take very long. We just have to let them do their thing. So it means, you know, letting the wild come back. And we have a role to play. We are also wild animals. You know, we don't think of ourselves particularly as that anymore, but we are. And there's nothing wrong with loving the animal beings that we are and remembering that we have a home and that we need habitat like everybody else and to, just to stop destroying it. Um, so what does that mean in terms of projects? Well, there's people doing this already. You know, they're doing all that, of, you know, returning ruminants to grasslands, repairing, um, you know, it's really easy to repair things like peat bogs. You just stop draining them and they come back and it's the same with forests like just stop taking them down they'll come back they know how to build themselves back so we need to you know pull back from our activities which means our consumption which means our population we have to accept this was a one-time blowout i know people don't want to hear this but how many generations three four maybe got to experience this way of life but the end was written into the beginning none of these substances reproduce themselves and we're on massive drawdown of the substances that do reproduce themselves. Um, I mean, you know, there's that Richard Heinberg book, the, the party's over. Like he also wrote a book called Peak Everything. Um, we've used it all, you know, the metals are gone. The, all the surface metals are long gone. Um, it's, you know, it, and, and our refusal to face this doesn't change the nature of the facts. Mm -hmm. So it seems to me that a lot of people here have probably face the nature of the facts. So now it's just a question of, all right, well, how do we how do we pull together all the people that know, you know, we're up against the edge, that are willing to name the kinds of destructive activities that humans have engaged in, and then look at what the solutions might be. And I don't know, I would rather have that future where we all decide together, all right, we're going to do this, we're going to, you know, reduce our, our birth rate to something completely reasonable for a few generations until um, our population is something that the planet could actually support without drawdown because right now we're on massive drawdown. And then what does that way of life look like? Um, and then we just have to dedicate ourselves to staying there, which hunter gatherers are really good at doing. You know, it's the farmers that blow past their population limits and pretty quickly. Uh, but hunter gatherers are very good at knowing the exact number of adults that ad, ad, adults to dependents that can can live in the place they call home. So I'm just rambling now. <laughs> what, no, that's, what that's great. I and and I, that's actually what I wanted the juice just just to come out and uh because i suspect that uh what you presented to us was very tight and this is the conversational part of it and this yes. is actually a very nice segue into mike uh, nickerson's uh question and dave doherty is on deck go ahead mike okay well thank you lorraine for outlining so close clearly what uh, homo colossus is doing to our planet <laughs> uh, an earlier term from one of the other speakers um, and you've touched on regenerative agriculture and, and uh, reducing population. But one of the things we work on is trying to encourage people to get back to the sources of uh, fulfillment that were ours until we became trained to consume, because we used to relate with each other and learn stuff and appreciate the world. And all those life-based activities require no more than what you need to be able to get up and, and make it through your day. So we, we, we use the phrase, more fun, less stuff. Uh, to sort of encourage people to let's tone down the material consumption and that whole industrial process and look to what life offers us uh, for our fulfillment so that we don't feel like we've been cut off. And, you know, I see that fitting into what you're saying very well. Yeah, I mean, the, the really sad, depressing, whatever, infuriating part of all of this is that it didn't even make us happy. Half of the people in the United States, fully half of us have been on antidepressants at some point in our lives. It made us the loneliest, most miserable people who have ever existed because everyone's cut off from everybody. And that we're a super social species, right? Like we really need to feel close to people, to be happy. And, you know, past a certain level of just your basic needs are cared for, you know, like food, shelter, some security that these things will continue it completely drops off the level of happiness and the level of income. Like it doesn't make any difference to earn a vast amount of money versus just enough money. People aren't any happier at that level um, because that's not what makes us happy. What makes us happy is knowing we're loved 
and, you know, having some ability to, you know, express our whatever, like our unique selves, you know, like whether you maybe you're a musician or maybe you're a painter or maybe, you know, the moon and the stars call to you or maybe you love helping mm -hmm. herd animals or you're a doctor, like who knows? We all have our, our calling. We all have the thing that we were meant to do, but it doesn't involve money. You know, it involves connection and love and community and communicating and being allowed to be who you are is it. And so, yeah, this, all of this stuff just, uh, it is killing us spiritually on top of everything else. It makes us so, good consumers, but that's, uh, that's the opposition that we need to overcome. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. I love your bumper sticker. Yeah. More fun, less stuff. Go for That's it. Great. That's great. Thank you, Mike. Uh, Jeff Passmore, you are on deck. And Dave, you have the floor. Well, thanks for the talk, Lier. Um, Fascinating. I was riveted. Um, the question I have, I want to follow with a couple of remarks. The question is, how might we manage a reduction in the size of the human population so that we avoid destroying what remains of our world? My concern here, this is the background, is that we don't have very many decades left in which to get this done, or we're going to be over that cliff. And all the things that have been very scary to many of the people who come to these presentations on a regular basis are going to happen. Uh, we're going to see more war. We're going to see people starving. We're going to see people running out of water and dying of thirst. Uh, so do you have some thoughts about how we manage this reduction so we don't experience those kinds of things, so we don't end up having to throw people in concentration camps. You know, the problem is that every institution on the planet is headed in the wrong direction because there's a lot of people with a lot of really good ideas about how to get this done. You know, it's not, it's not technically that difficult, honestly. The question really is political. Like, do we have the will to do it? And I'm sure everybody here knows, but there's not a single politician that's ever going to get elected by saying out loud the facts of the situation. We're running out of fossil fuel. We wrecked the planet by using it. We've only got a few years and we need to stop. Nobody's going to get elected saying that. So that's one of the hard parts, right, is that our political institutions are honestly never going to be on our side. I have a really hard time imagining how that's ever going to happen. So, you know, we can sort of kiss that part of it goodbye. So now it's down to all of us. <laughs> and this is where like, you know, the relocalizing people and you know, like all of that stuff, the permaculture, um, you know, may hold some hope. Um, I'm afraid that it's gonna take bigger institutional sticks and carrots to get the job done. And there's examples from around the world of countries that have tried to do this, you know, that have said, all right, we've got too many people. How do we reduce the population? Um, and they've been pretty successful at it. It isn't really that hard. It turns out to be fairly plastic. You know, the the, the number of children that people desire is very expandable and contractible. Um, with a tiny bit of pressure, it can go one way or the other. And so by applying the right kinds of positive pressures, uh, people start doing it. They start having less children and nobody gets hurt in the process. Um, you just make it easy for them to do it essentially and they'll do it. So, and I'm thinking of Iran here. That's the really interesting example to me is Iran because, you know, it's run by a religious theocracy essentially. Um, but they could see that there were way too many people and that they were essentially reprodu reproducing at the the, re the upper limit of, of human biology. And I was like, we're not going to have anywhere to sit or stand, let alone like food to eat in another generation or two. And so they had a huge meeting where they got all the stakeholders together and they thought, all right, well, how are we going to do this? What do we know about it? And what we know about it is we have to raise the status of women. Um, so we're going to have all of these, you know, different um, sort of public health measures to sort of get this done. So they had a huge literacy campaign to teach women and girls to read. And then they went out community by community and um, they trained sort of older women to talk about birth control to younger women. So you were, you know, given like an area of your town or your city that was like, you know, however many blocks you could, you could circulate. Um, and just go door to door and knock on the door and ask the women there, do you want birth control? Do you need birth control? What do you know about birth control? They made all the birth control free. Um, they set up little like community clinics in every neighborhood where it was just simply free to get birth control. They got all the storytellers in the culture to get in on it. So um, the people who wrote soap operas were invited in um, and they would include it then in their storylines about getting birth control was part of the story. Um, and they made it, you had to get, um, to get a marriage license, both the man and the woman couple had to get um, 
a, had to take a class that explained human reproduction and birth control. Um, and then they got the religious leaders in on the project as well. So they um, got them all to say that uh, it's not anywhere in the Quran and nobody cares. It's not against our religion to get a vasectomy, please do this. And like literally the next day, all these men lined up around the block to get vasectomies. Cause as it turns out, they didn't want 12 children either. It's way too many to support. <laughs> Nobody was interested in this. Um, one or two, as it turns out, was about what everybody wanted. So if you gave everybody enough food, um, access to birth control, enough understanding of how it worked, some choices about what they, what kind they wanted, and just made it free, um, it worked. And also the little carrot in the, in the, in the little stick in all the carrots. Um, if you had one child or two children, you got a bunch of state support, so you could get like a food stamp kind of program. Um, help with things like heat and electricity, you know, your basic whatever, your needs met, lots of good health care. The moment you had that third child, it all went away. So they didn't actively punish you, but all the goodies got withdrawn. And um, it worked immediately. They saw this, you know, vast reduction in the birth rate. So, you know, but it took all those institutions working together. And this is the problem. We're not doing that. There's no reason that we couldn't, but we're not. So I don't know, whatever pressure all of you are putting on your governments and your other institutions that you have any access to, um, we just need to keep applying it because they've got to get on board with this. It, it would I, work. You know, we I, could do it, right? There's no physical yeah, reason. I, we I appreciate all of that. And, yeah. and I don't want to criticize in any way, but my point is really that we don't have 80 years or 100 years to get this we done. Don't. And if we were to cut loose 8.1 billion people to go and be hunter gatherers, we would probably do as much damage as we're currently doing. We can't, af we can't afford to do that anymore. So it, what kinds of solutions are there to getting the population down, not just by having fewer children, in a manageable way, in a way that is ethical, is there a, is there in fact some kind of uh, magic bullet that will help us reduce our population in an ethical manner? No, I mean there just isn't. So the best thing we can do is, you know, hope for the future that we will get enough institutional support to do the kinds of measures that have been proven to reduce the birth rate. Um, while we can repair as much of the planet as possible, start sequestering as much carbon as possible, a lot of food can be produced as that's happening. I mean, the, you know, the grass-fed bison, grass-fed beef, what you pick your rumen and it doesn't matter. Um, these can be incredibly fucking fecund areas to produce food for people. So, you know, if we can swap out, these annual grains are going to stop growing. The moment that the hit temperature hits 98 degrees, the plants cannot transpire fast enough and growth simply stops. So as we head into more and more summers where the temperature is 100, 102, 104, for weeks on end, we're looking at mass starvation. So there is going to have to be a point where more people wake up to how bad it is. I mean, it's just, it's going to happen. We're going to run out of food. And about 80% of the calories around the globe that people now eat is those annual grains. So we've really backed ourselves into a corner. I mean, there's reason to panic here. Um, and then seeing that, you know, just the state of how, how bad this is compared to how little uh, pressure is being applied. Um, I, I, hear your, I hear your tone of voice and I share your despair and your fear about this because if we don't do this, um, there is going to be mass starvation. I don't say this with any glee, it's horrifying. Um, but every single civilization that's come before, and there've been 34, they've all ended in collapse. And the last proteins in every pot is always human, i.e. cannibalism. Um, people are starving, they're going to eat what they have to. And it's ugly, ugly, ugly stuff. Mm. So that's, you know, if we don't get this done, that's the future that awaits us. And it's not pretty. So I, we're, we're, we're at an impasse here. And it, we, I, yeah, I don't know what else to say. James Howard Kunstler has this great quote about how we need to be reality-based adults. And I feel like that's what I'm begging everyone to do is like, we've got to face this reality because otherwise it's going to happen and it's going to be ugly. We could make it a lot less ugly by taking control of it. We have to face the situation. Everybody has to face this situation. We've got to get over the entitlement. We have to get over our addiction to this way of life. Um, and then we've got to make some hard decisions about it. But, you know, if 
I think if all of us pulled together and we were doing it, I think it could be done. But I, you know, we're just, none of us are headed in the right direction. You know, as a society, it's all in the wrong direction. So I, I wish I had a better answer for you. It well, it's like a good a, answer in yeah. that, very frank. Thank you. It sounds like a great segue to uh, Jeff. And uh, let's see, I'm sorry, I should have looked before that uh, person on deck. I think that is, uh, hmm. Well, I'll tell you in a, in a chat. So go ahead, Jeff, with your question comment. Well, it's hard to know where to start. There's so many comments one could make, oh, but try to be uh, brief, and because there are yeah, some no, other no, people. I'm, I'm, oh. Claude, I, you know, I, oh, I don't okay. need to be told that. Um, I'll be much briefer than Dave, uh, and you know, Mother Nature will have its revenge. We're not going to wake up to this, the air. Uh, so I, there's going to be a huge mass extinction, mass starvation, whatever you want to call it, I don't see. It's the ultimate conceit for humankind to think that life is going to continue in the future as we know it. And so, uh, you know, uh, but I, I, my question, and I don't see 8 billion people being hunter-gatherers, that's just not going to happen. So I'm wondering, though, on a personal level, Lear, where do you live and what supplies your food and energy needs? So I live in Northern California. Um, I live in a little town called Crescent City, which is the last town before Oregon. So it's way Northern California and we're right on the coast. So the ocean is, is right there. I can hear the sea lions every night. Um, and my house is passive solar. So, and it's also a very mild climate. So it's very easy to do that. And I have a backup wood stove um, and I can you know get all the wood I would ever need just from harvesting in the forest. It's, you know, a tree falls once in a while. It's all I need. So um, I'm very lucky though. You know, it's I've gotten to live this life that I really like um, and that makes me happy. And I know that that's not really the, the goal for me is not to live the purest life I can while the world goes down in flames. Um, but it does make me very happy to live this way. I love my little house with my giant windows <laughs> um, and I love being surrounded by, you know, 20 acres of land that I've preserved for it's I'm rural enough that there's mountain lions here and I protected as much land as I could earn money to protect. And it it makes me incredibly happy knowing that there's apex predators here. And if they can just hang on a little while longer, they might still be here in a hundred years. Knowing that I played a part in protecting some of that land makes me incredibly happy. Um, there's coyotes, there's bears, and there's mountain lions. And we did have a wolf a few years ago. So it's, <laughs> please let the wolves come back, please. It would make me incredibly happy. Um, and then for okay. food, I am very, um, I mean, I live in a rural area, so the, the local food is really easy. I've grown a lot of my own food. I've raised a lot of my own food. Um, I'm not doing that right now. I just don't have time. I feel like there's way more important things for me to be doing. As happy as it made me to do those things, I've had to kind of let them go. But I do support local people who are doing them. So there's lots of really great grass-based farms where I live. So I can get, um, you know, grass-based beef and I can get grass-fed dairy and I can get, you know, pasture-raised chickens and pasture-raised pork. And it's all just basically my neighbors growing it. So it's really, it's very, it, I feel very at ease with that. I feel very much at peace with the way that I'm able to support all of that with what I'm doing. Um, and a lot of other people could be doing that. Like we could be supporting the places that are repairing topsoil and sequestering carbon and repairing the water table and re, you know repairing the, the native communities and letting the animals come back. And like all of that can be done pretty easily. Um, even if you live in a city, you can at least be supporting that food. So I highly recommend the website eatwild.org um, and they have Canada as well as the United States. And it's all about pasture-based grass-based farming, why it's good, how all the reasons it's good, how you can get involved and then state by state, region by region, where to get the good food. So you can go right to the farm and get it. So um, that's kind of what I do. Um, yeah. And it's, I have my own well, I've got, a lot of my own stuff going so um it's a good life that's the thing and it's it's simple and i don't i i really we we really could want for nothing i mean the planet gave us everything we needed so uh, but i agree you. with you i don't think we're headed anywhere good i don't i'm not going to give up just because it's not my personality but i i personally don't have a lot of hope that this is going to end anyway but in disaster but as i always say like as long as there's one tree and two wolves i'm going to keep fighting well, that's a great philosophy there because, you know, we can't just crawl into a hole and die. 
Um, so uh, thank Agreed. you very much, Jeff. Uh, Mike Hanauer Boston is on deck and Richard has the, the floor for his question. Okay, thank you. Um, Lear, I have a, a question for you because you pointed out a lot in your talk about the damage that the renewables do uh, to the environment and that uh, you also suggest that fossil fuels are not replaceable as it is. Uh, this year is a very good example of the record number of fires, the rising temperatures that we've had and the rising uh, ocean temperatures, which will continue to rise for the next 20 to 30 years, given the emissions that we currently have that have uh, been already put into the air from the fossil fuel industry. Do you think that would happen if the renewal, everything was switched to the renewables? Do you think we would have the continuing rise in temperatures and oceans and, and, and the climate and so forth that we surpass and where we've got this vicious cycle of melting um, uh, ice caps and so forth, that all that would continue to happen? Sorry, the dogs declared an emergency, a security emergency, so I had to let them out. Um, uh, yeah, I think there may be tipping points that have already been reached, such that the spiral is mm -hmm. not unstoppable. But I also think that we don't really, I don't think we fully fathom how much nature can repair if we give it a chance. And I say this just from being in um, a lot of different groups that talk about soil as the solution that, you know, if we let the grasslands try to repair by building the soil that they do naturally, that there's a, still a tremendous amount of hope that we could, in fact, pull a great deal of that carbon out of the atmosphere. So I'm not willing to give up before we've at least tried it. So um, there's- What are you recommending as a source of energy? Well, I think we need to think about, you know, what, what we are allowed as a species, that we don't get to just take everything we want you know, right now it's like 86% of either the primary or the secondary um, energy that falls on the planet every day goes to humans, right? And the, that's just completely unfair. And also, um, I don't know how we think we're going to survive without all these other creatures that do such basic things like create soil and create oxygen and clean the water for us and all of this. Like it's it's a one-way ticket to nowhere good. Um, so what we need, first of all, we need to we need to acknowledge that industrial civilization was a one-time blowout and we were one of the only few generations that was ever going to get to experience it that this way of life you know the end was built into the beginning that there was no other way it was going to end but collapse you can't just keep taking and using and using and taking right um so that's one but then the second thing that we have to acknowledge is that there's really no alternative to this that there is no other fuel source that's going to make up for you know, the amount of energy that it takes to use, to, to create this way of life is incredibly, it's incredibly energy intensive. I mean, you saw that graph that I had, the amount of energy that we're using just keeps up and up and up and up. Um, and that's what it takes. So if like, if, if you had to, have, for instance, if you had to power a car just using human energy, I think you'd have 2000 slaves. That's how much human energy would have to go into it. And that's crazy. Like the only way we're able to do that is because we're burning fossil fuel. Well, we've used all the fossil fuel and we've wrecked the planet by doing it. Where eventually there won't be any, or there won't be any left that's worth taking. It'll cost more than it's worth to get it out of the ground. This is just facts. And it just seems that no one wants to face the facts. So we have to face it. And then we have to realize that this way of life never had a future. So what is the way of life that we then are left with? And it's one that's a lot more, um, a lot more connected to each other, a lot more where we find joy in, in other, other ways of being that I think in fact make us happier, um, but it's not this. Like we just have to acknowledge that we don't have a right to this. And not only that, this is no longer possible. It's, we've used up all the stuff. It's, it just can't be done. Like, and even like Jacobson's plan about, oh, we're gonna use all the, the wind and the solar and the this and the that, the amount of stuff required just to build that infrastructure, it literally doesn't exist on the planet. We, it's gone. Like there's. The steel, even just the steel alone, there's no more iron ore. Like we're, we're going to use it all for what? To build some wind turbines? And then in 10 years when they have to be replaced, there's no more. So I, it's hard. Nobody really wants to have this discussion except maybe the have more fun bumper sticker people. But this wasn't even a way of life that made us happy. So I think we should just say goodbye to it um, and reclaim our real nature as, as human animals who are made happy by doing a really different set of activities than what we're doing right now. That's the best I got for you. 
And then, you know, we get a little bit of sun every day. So that's great. Capture the sun in whatever way you can. Um, and maybe some wood. You know, I've, I've got wood in my forest. It's not hurting the forest for me to use a tiny bit of it. Um, but I'm not using vast sums of it. You know, like I don't use enough. I'm not trying to power an industrial economy with it. You know, it's it's just my house. Once in a while, needs some wood. That's all. Passive solar is great. I mean, it, you can learn the principles in, a, in a, a morning and anybody can do it. You know, the sun falls on everybody and it's free. So I'm totally into passive solar. You can heat water with passive solar. There's all kinds of fun stuff you can do with passive solar. Um, and it's not hard. And it, traditional ag the traditional ways people have done architecture it has a lot of wisdom. You know, how you can, um, thermal mass, you know, when it hits the either direct or indirectly, if your house has thermal mass in it, it will keep the temperature very moderate. I have tons of thermal mass in my house. I've got, you know, besides the wood stove, I have all this tile that I put in there. Um, and it, the temperature just stays incredibly warm, even in the winter and never gets hot in the summer. And it, it's, it's great. And I just, I encourage everybody to learn about that, but I don't know. It's, it's a hard thing because people are very attached to this way of life and our lives depend on it. We are dependent on it for our food, for our water, for our medical care. I get why we're attached to it. And I'm, I'm not saying this is easy, but it really is emotional. Um, it's not, it's not intellectually that challenging. Um, it's not physically against the laws of physics or chemistry, what I'm saying. Um, but there is definitely an emotional attachment to this, which I'm not saying I don't have it either. I'm not like some, I'm not like a better person than anybody else. You know, like I, we didn't have the internet for five days and I was like, oh no, yeah, <laughs> where's the internet? It. When's it going to come back? You know, and I was like, I hate the internet. Why do I feel this way? I would be I so glad say, there's the heat forever, pumps too, but, right? So yeah. there's a whole issue of heat pumps, which has not been mentioned. Um, which, sure. Yeah, any of know. it's great. Yeah. Um, my so um, I, speaking of electricity, my um, my battery has just drained down and given me a warning. I'm going to plug in, but you all keep talking. I just got to grab my cord. So I think that's a nice segue. Um, Ralph Martin, you are on deck. Please turn on your your uh, video and your mic and um, your microphone. And Mike Hanauer, Boston, you have the floor as soon as Lear comes back. I'm kind of I'm here. I'm just here. plugging in. There we go. Perfect. There we so go. <laughs> if you have the courtesy to wait till she sits down, we're good, good to go. And I invite more questions because I'm going to start hitting comments. We're running out of questions. Yeah. And I, first is thank you for your enlightening talk and your and your bravery. And I I sure hope somehow we can, you know, make you the next Rachel Carson. Um, I I wanted to ask you, you know, you talked a lot about technology and. And I, I do have a follow up, but but where do you see what do you see as technology's role, if any, you know, in either getting to or within a sustainable civilization? So the best um, thing to read about this, I'm going to recommend, is Lewis Mumford, and he, I mean, he has a lot of huge books you could read, but the little essay that really kicks off everything about Lewis Mumford is called Authoritarian and Democratic Techniques. And it was written in 1964, the year I was born. And um, it's only about 15 pages, but this is where he finally is like, a, in his own life was like the turning point where he realizes that technology is not neutral and that a lot of it was in fact quite injurious to the planet and to the human spirit. And so that's his, he's got this, you know, he bifurcates technology into, technologies that are authoritarian that you know require the hierarchies and the militarization and the destruction of the planet and then other kinds of technologies that are democratic that can't be taken away from anybody and that don't require you know a, a, a massive army to make them possible or you know the importation of resources from halfway around the globe um, and I you know things like passive solar we've already talked about but they're available to anybody nobody can take that away from you and it's the same with you know, building a, you know, like my house, it's very simple. Um, the flint arrowheads for hunting or bow and arrow, anybody can learn to make those things. Um, a, a, a clay oven for cooking food. Um, these are all things that you can learn to make in, you know, with the materials that are around you. And they're going to look different from region to region. You know, everybody's going to have a different 
you know, this, it's just going to be a different environment. So you're going to have different things at your disposal and different needs and all of this. But, you know, I don't need to make an igloo and there's no ice here anyway. So I couldn't. But people who live up above the Arctic Circle figured that out. Um, and they, you know, they stay warm in the winter and it's very cold. So and that's a totally democratic technique. Anybody can learn to build those kinds of houses. Um, anyway, I would just highly recommend reading that essay. And then if you want to read you know, the massive volumes that he wrote about this, it's it's well worth it because it makes you realize exactly what what humans have done to ourselves by embracing these kinds of technologies that were and and the point that he makes that I think is is well worth understanding is that it's it's the technologies don't just change how we do things, they change the nature of the culture itself. So they sort of come as a suite. You know, you have the actual machines um, and then the human machines that make the machines and then are run by the machines. Um, and then you have how the culture changes so that you end up with myths that are about domination and conquering and, you know, heroes that kill the earth spirits and, you know, Gilgamesh. And like, that's the first, you know, the, the classic myth. That's the first myth of our quote civilization is Gilgamesh deforesting the mountainside and having to kill the spirit of the mountain in order to do it. It was a, a living spirit in the mountain that had to be killed. And this is the first myth of the founding myth of Western civilization. And yeah, it is. That's exactly what's happened. Um, so anyway, he talks about all of that, how all of that just comes together as a package. You can't just pull up the technology and not have all the bad stuff because that's what it relies on. And then also you need to tell yourself a story about it while you're doing it. And so these are the stories that get created to make the culture. So I don't know if that actually answered your question, but Lewis Mumford, authoritarian and democratic techniques, just even if you just read that little pamphlet, it explains, to me, it explained so much of what I was seeing and didn't quite have words for. It's it's very illuminating. So if I read you right, you are at least saying that technology is still a part of a sustainable society. It's gotta be well chosen. Well, yeah, but the well chosen is the hard part because it has to be the democratic kind and not the authoritarian kind. And that is hard on us because we want the other kind. We've gotten very used to it and we really like it. But, you know, there's still people alive today who know that the mountain is sacred and that you shouldn't kill the spirit of the mountain and you shouldn't dig into the mountain and you shouldn't blow up the mountain and you shouldn't destroy the river that comes out of the mountain either. And we can't have any of these goodies without doing all of that. And it, we have to stop separating you know, the end product from the process. Like we have to take a good hard look at where all of this comes from. And then we have to face what we've done. And it it's not gonna be the way of life that we're used to, that's for sure. One of the scariest things to me is, is free energy, you know, as in fusion. Um, how do you look at that issue? Well, I don't think it's gonna happen. I don't think it's really possible. But if it was, I think it would be the worst thing that would ever happen to the planet because they're just going to eat it to the bone then. There won't be a single thing in the way. That's the only deterrent right now is that it, it does cost to do these things. You know, there is an energy cost that goes into it. But if it was free, I, I we'd be dead in a decade. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, we had a siren going off here. Uh, David Harries is on deck, and Samrat, you have uh, the opportunity to ask your question. Hey, uh, hi, Lear. I just wanted to know, uh, how is your book doing? It's been a while um, now, so right. I've spoken. Yeah. Um, it's a tiny little publisher. We couldn't find a bigger publisher. We had a hard, hard time getting it published, so... I think for a small publisher, he's pretty happy with it. Um, but I really wish we'd had a major publisher and we could get on the New York Times bestseller list or something a little bit. We are in a desperate situation. You wouldn't be on this call right now if you didn't know that. And I'm, it's just kind of depressing that um, nobody wants to hear it. <laughs> I get that this message is not fun, but it is reality. One of the publishers who has published some of our other books in the past uh, she rejected it. And what she said was, if this book is true, then everything I've done with my life um, is for nothing. And I just can't believe that. So I'm not going to publish your book. I was like, 
you could just change your mind. Like you could just learn something and decide that, all right, I believe some things that don't turn out to be true. I'm glad to have the truth. I will make better decisions. But no, she literally said, I, I don't want to believe this. Therefore, I'm not going to publish your book. And she didn't. So yeah, we got stuck. He's very brave, Paul Cohen, our publisher. I, I like him a great deal. He's a nice guy, um, but nobody else would take it. So we're stuck there kind of at the very bottom. Um, so it's not all right. And we've gotten some really nice reviews. Like all the Amazon reviews are just, people say wonderful things about the book and how it changed their minds. And it's like, you know, an overwhelming amount of information and it's it's irrefutable. And wow, we're in a bad situation. And I'm, I'm glad these people are telling the truth. So that always, you know, warms your heart as a writer that you change somebody's mind about something that's pretty profound is, it's a burden and it's also a joy. So I'm, I'm glad I got to do that a little bit, but um, yeah, you know, it is what it is. Like, I'm super happy we got published at all. And then also, come on people, like the, the clock is ticking on the planet. We, we really need to, it's not my book. I don't care. Read another book like it, you know, like, but these are the books that we need to be discussing, like seriously on a policy level, let's discuss them. Like people need to be understanding this. Everybody needs to be understanding this, not just like the 30 people who already know it's bad and got on this call. So thank you for your question. Um, you can buy it though, and you can give it out to your friends, especially if you know, like, oh, I don't know, somebody who's in public policy or even small small level government, somebody, um, anybody in the Beltway in Washington, D.C., anybody in wherever you live, like just get it into well, the hands of Yeah, people. like personally, I'm citing the book to everybody that I know about. Yeah. It, you know? Oh, thank you. So there's a couple of other books which were written earlier which you may know about, written by Donella Meadows and all. But yeah, yeah sure. absolutely. I'm yeah. citing your book uh, to anybody that I know about who should be reading. You know? Thank so you. So it's made an impact. Yeah, thanks so much. Okay. Yeah. And it's and I really, really appreciate being able to come on these kinds of seminars and podcasts because a lot of people don't have time to read a book. I get it. But if it's something that's done verbally and they can listen in the car or listen while they're you know, doing the dishes or whatever, um, they'll absorb some of the information anyway. So I really appreciate everybody that's been involved in putting this one on. Uh, I know it's a lot of work and I, I really, really appreciate being asked to join. Thanks so much. Yeah. Okay, uh, David Harry's, and we're nearing the end, um, but we still have several minutes to go, another 10 minutes if we need it. Go ahead, yeah. David. Uh, I really, I really enjoyed the way you put that together. Um, but what it did, it reconfirmed. I think you were at the beginning when I made my little point about nobody in charge. Nobody's in charge because everybody's been overwhelmed by yeah. the desperate situation. But you said something that has resonated with me for a long time. I, I do strategic foresight and I've been a peacekeeper in uniform and out of uniform and with the UN. And I've been in horrible places caused by us but you said no politician is going to say stop because they won't get reelected. right well elections are a democratic feature so what do we need more really powerful dictators <laughs> yeah i don't think that's going to help either um i mean there the politicians are only going to change their minds because we put pressure on them honestly yeah. Anyone who's ever been in office and has done anything good will say, listen, the only reason I got it done was because there was so much public pressure on me that I went ahead and did it. Even if they're smart and they understand how bad it is, even if they agree with us in their heart of hearts, they can't do it and, and get reelected. So I think it would have to be somebody who, A, was willing to get into office and then not care about reelection because they probably wouldn't. But also, it really depends on all of us applying that democratic pressure to say, we want you to tell the truth. We are willing to go with you down this path and say, um, this way of life has no future. We have completely wrecked our planet. We are in an emergency situation and things have got to change now. You know, We need some plans. We need A, B, C, D. How are we gonna get this done so that society doesn't completely collapse into a failed state while we you know, chew on our neighbor's bones <laughs> on our way out? Like that's what we're looking at if, we don't take strong action. And there's plenty of people, I think, who have the pieces. We could put this all together and get it done. But well, we need the politicians. Society revolution? I, I mean, I don't, I don't know if we want to use that word or not. I don't think it, I, 
Can yeah, I, from the ground up, we need a completely different way of life. We absolutely do. Bill uh, Reese uses that by, word. I would rather get there by peaceful ends if we can, because if we don't, I, I don't know that we're going to get there. You know, if we can't all join hands and get it done, I, I think it is just going to end in that sort of Mad Max end of the world sort of you know nightmarish fantasy that we've all we've all seen the movies you know and it or it could be worse i mean if if all of those spirals really do go down we may not even have oxygen in 100 years like who knows if all the plankton die it's two-thirds of the world's oxygen we are pushing the oceans past the point of no return so it could be that bad where there's nothing left of bacteria and that's you know that's the really gruesome scenario And with that, I will announce that this is our last question coming from uh, Ralph Martin. And before that, I'll just tell you that recently, uh, Bill Reese uses the revolution word. So uh, until they cart us away, I guess it's okay for us to talk that way too, because it doesn't appear that uh, political social action is making a difference. Right. So uh, with that editorial comment, Ralph, do you have your question that you can give? Uh, for our last question. Yes. Um, sorry that my video is not working, but I can talk. Um, I appreciate what you said about grasslands. I've done a lot of research on forages and grazing and so on. Um, it seems to me that one option as we power down or we decrease human consumption or we try to mitigate the effects of collapse would be to say that on arable land, we will only grow food crops except for forage crops. And that would mean that livestock would only eat, ruminants would eat forages and other livestock would eat the forages they can or the failed food crops that do not meet specs for human consumption. Does that seem like a reasonable way to you of powering down? Yeah, I mean, I think that would be a good first step. So remember that um, if you want to talk about a creature like, you know, a cow, um, around well, around 86% of what they already eat is stuff that humans can't eat. And that's even right. with them in horrible CAFO situations, which of course everybody here is appalled by. Let's put that right out of the way. We all hate factory farming. We don't even need to discuss it. But 86% of what they're eating is leftovers that we don't want. So it's things like, you know, the stalk from the wheat, we're, we're, we cannot eat that. We have no mechanism to digest cellulose. Um, or it's the processing of the wheat into something that humans can digest or want to digest. So for instance, the bran, like when they refine the wheat, all this stuff comes off it, humans don't want it. Where does it go? Well, you can feed that to pigs. Um, so uh, as that's what the United Nations says, 86% of it is just stuff that either, either it's just out and out grass that humans can't eat or it's the kind of leftover stuff that's um, a byproduct of agricultural foods that we don't want. So that we're already mostly there in terms of feeding them stuff that we can't eat so that they're not in competition with us. Um, and then I would say the next step is we basically stop growing agricultural products and just let the grasses come back. And then we can go back to being the apex predators on the bison or the cattle or the, you know, pick your species. I don't, even care at this point what's out there roaming around as long as somebody is there to stimulate the grasses um and do their you know s curve thing and keep sequestering the carbon what, and that can just go beans? on forever you know like that what, is a what about beans and lentils i mean i don't particularly think they're ed edible and i don't think that they're great for the soil either so i would just prefer to be done with the annual crops and just declare it a failed experiment and just let all the grasses in the forest come back and let animals eat the cellulose and then we eat the animals and then the bacteria eats us and call it a day. Just decide that it was a bad idea to get go down that path, that annuals were just really not a thing that we should have decided we were going to try. Um, that's me. That's what I would rather see. I would just rather let the world come back and stop taking all that land just for humans. And I think we'd have a much better time keeping our population in check if we did that as well, because it becomes really obvious. And that's why hunter gatherers are really good at it. It's really obvious right away that you've overshot your land base and the agriculturalists just keep expanding. Um, that's the history of the thing anyway. So I don't know why we would do a better job of it in the future. So, but I think it's a good place to start. 
I think it's absolutely a good place to start. Anything that's a good place to start is where we should start. So um, we have all these ideas and I, it's, if they would just put all of us in charge, the 30 people on this call, pretty sure we could get it done. That's the thing, right? But no one's ever gonna put us in a position of power. We can barely get our books published. Actually, we have discussions and we're not sure. I'm not sure that I, I would know what to do. Uh, but anyway, that's a, a whole nother matter. Thank you so oh, much, Lara. I would get it done. Come okay, on, well, there me. we go. You get my vote. Um, <laughs> I'm going to turn the floor over to our, pre our president, our chairman of the board, uh, um, Gene Doherty, for our official thank you. Go ahead, Gene. Thank you, Claude. And thank you, Lier. This this has been a very interesting presentation that you've given us. And I agree with, uh, I can't remember who it was who said, I like the way you put all of this together. It is a very difficult subject to get people to um, fully understand and to grapple with. And you've done it in a way that made it engaging at the very least, even though it is a bit depressing <laughs> to think about the consequences of things. So with that, I'd like to say thank you very much for, for having taken the time to do this presentation for us here today. And um, so, Thank you. And uh, for those of you who are still on the call, uh, I would encourage you to go to our website, CanadianCore.com. And when you get there, if you go on the Stay Informed section and sign up for that, you will be, get the information about this particular talk when it becomes available and all the other talks that we have had on our Zoom series up to this point. You can look at them, you can search, you can find information about all of the things that we have been doing. The uh, Canadian Association for the Club of Rome is a charitable organization. And you, if you're interested in finding out more about what we do, uh, you can find that information on our website as well. And if you're interested in becoming a member, encourage you to fill out for a membership form and put it through. So with that, I'd like to say thank you again. And I look forward to some further discussions down the line. Thank you. <laughs>